Hey, welcome back to Passive Income Pilots, everyone. Tate Durier here on another beautiful week with uh, Ryan Gibson. What's up, Ryan? Good afternoon, Tate. How are you? Or good morning to you in Hawaii? Good morning. That is that is true. We're three hour time difference now, so uh, not uh, that I, I always love that two hour time change to the West Coast during the winter. It's wonderful. <laughs> we just switched back. But uh, what's new with you? Not much. Uh, just. Um... You know, I'm excited. You know, sometimes real estate goes well, sometimes it goes goes bad. But right now, you know, we're in our spring leasing season, meaning that storage typically does really well March through call it uh, August, September time time frame when people are really on the move and going. And it's fun watching these facilities fill up. Uh, and uh, you know, it's always fun to be in leasing season. So uh, I'm in good spirits, and the sun is shining here, and going to get out and walk it. around the lake later on this afternoon. So super excited. Excellent. Well, uh, yeah, we are just having a blast. Lots of things going on at Turbine. Uh, it's just, it's a great year to buy. You know, interest rates yeah. are high. We're seeing deals. It's fantastic. And uh, I'm going to Sydney tomorrow. Instead of what I've been doing for the last six years, teaching IOEs, uh, IOE to new hires and doing MinRest overnights on the West Coast, I'm doing a four-day Sydney trip with, uh, with an old buddy of mine back in the right seat. The only thing that's weird is the right seat is just uh, it's not as comfortable. I don't know if they make it out of a different material or something, but, uh, man, it's we'll just, have to uh, write it to Airbus for you. I, I'm going to have to have, uh, have my buddy write that up. Exactly. Well, cool. Well, today we've got, uh, Leica DeVita, who is a dear friend of mine for the past decade. Uh, she has a multifaceted role in real estate. She's uh, fantastic. To, to say the least. I mean, she's done everything, flips, rentals, multifamily, building dadus, which is a just detached accessory dwelling unit in Seattle. It's a big thing. Buy a single family lot, build a, build a second home in your backyard. She's done that. She's hosted meetups. She's got a huge Instagram following. She's like, but at the end of the day, like she has flipped over, you know, done over 200 deals and really gotten kind of kicked in the teeth, punched in the face. And, you know, but she, her attitude is just inspiring. I mean, she, I have, she's always got an upbeat attitude. She's always got a smile. She's always got a way through things, which is why we wanted to bring her on the show. Uh, specifically, she's a one woman army that does everything from flipping homes to passive income. Uh, she helps investors, retail buyers. She's a licensed real estate agent, transacted numerous homes. Um, and, uh, you know, she's an advisor on a board of an up and coming real estate startup. I know she sits on the board of a real estate private lending fund and uh, just an awesome person all around. So, uh, and while that might sound, you know, unrelatable because that's yes. like so far ahead of where you might be, we talk a lot about how to get started and, and what it takes to go from zero to one. So I think people have a lot of uh, actionable insights from the episode. Yeah. So with that, let's get to the show. Leica, welcome to the show. Uh, really excited to have you on. Thanks, Ryan. Um, we were just talking about how long we've known each other. And it's just been, you know, it's been so fun having some really good friends in the industry to talk about deals and just cry on each other's shoulders. And, um, <laughs> and then also, you know, uh, pat each other on the back sometimes. So thank you for having me. Yeah, so I... I think your story is so interesting, but just to start top level, I feel like you're the the person in real estate that I know that is the most fearless, has gotten punched in the face, but still has an amazing attitude around investing in real estate. And uh, <laughs> that's, those are sort of like the chops you need to have to like be a successful active real estate investor. But I, I think what you do so well is you really just help people take their first step. And, and, and also like really connect people well in a real estate networking group. I know you have the real estate at work networking group here in Seattle and you get NFL football players, you get people that are, you know, huge in the mortgage industry, huge in the real estate industry, like show up to your, to your meetup and you pack the room with like hundreds of people, um, and just provide a really great conduit. So that, so anyway, um, you know, go ahead and just kick us off with just kind of some of the, you know, kind of how you got into real estate and sort of a little bit about your background. Sure. Yeah. I uh, actually grew up in India and moved here about 17 years ago. I used to work for Nordstrom Corporate in their brand merchandise strategy division. And then one day I had this realization that I can't do this anymore. I can't work for someone else. I'm too much of an entrepreneur for that. 
And actually, that was 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, I started my company investing in real estate. Also just happened to be by chance that I found this. Um, I heard an ad on a radio show for this thing called flipping homes. And I was like, what is that? Like, because where I grew up, you don't flip homes. You just raise the home and then build from scratch. So I was just fascinated by the whole concept. And so I started digging deep. And then within a couple of months of that, I started to learn, like just educate myself and surround myself by other investors uh, that were actually doing this. I quit my W-2 and go into investing full time. And at that point, I said to myself, I was like, okay, if this thing, I was like, if I don't succeed, I can always go back to a corporate job. But this is something I don't want to let this moment pass and say, wow, I regret not having done this before. Um, that's kind of what got me into real estate. And I started flipping homes and now it's been 10 years and over a hundred homes flip. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and this is like, this is like real, like some people say, oh, I flipped a hundred homes, like they've wholesaled or whatever. But like, yeah. like a, you've been on the ground on all hundred of these homes. Like you, you have bought them, yeah. you've done the work yourself. You uh, like, you, like, you know, found the deal. Yeah, I still like yeah. last week I spent my whole Saturday at the wholesale landscaping um, factory, like buying plants for my new project. I still do all my trim. I still design all my homes. None of my homes are cosmetic, like lipstick. They're all full gut renovations, like engineering, structural, seismic retrofits. Like, you know, Seattle has some old, old homes. So we just take it all down to the studs and rebuild from scratch. So much harder than new construction because I just did one side by side. I built a brand new home and then I flipped a house. So much harder to flip a house. Yeah, yeah I can totally. imagine. Like, uh, so I've got a question for you. So for someone who's, you know, never bought a piece of real estate in their life and they're like, Ooh, this seems like this, this unscalable wall, bit of overwhelm. Can you talk about like, what was the scariest moment when you first got into this? What was your first deal like? Was there any like gut punch moment when, when you thought maybe I shouldn't have done this? Yeah, within like a month of, um, so I went under contract on my very, very first deal and I bought it sight unseen. And I, you know, I believe someone else when they said that the rehab budget was only 60K. And then when I walked it, I realized it was more like 150K. Cool. So that was like a gut punch times 10. Um, and it started there and Till now, it hasn't ended. I wish I could say, wow, I live this fairy tale life now and I just live off my passive income and life is rosy. It's not the case. Like every project comes with its own ups and downs. Yes, you stand to lo like make a lot of money, but also it takes an enormous amount of mountains to push to get there. Right. T talk about a story where you you failed epically and right. and and how <laughs> right easy not, easy we're so easy here, yeah, we're not in here to talk about all the successes right like <laughs> i just you know when you when you swing the bat a hundred times and do a hundred deals right uh you're gonna fail and you sort of got to get through that and you know sometimes people like hit the ball perfectly the first 10 swings and they think that it's always going to be that way and some people swing the the bat and miss the ball the first 10 times and think they just can't do this. So is there, is there anything that, was there one deal that really course corrected your success trajectory of kind of where we are today? Yeah, I feel like every deal has a moment or two that course corrects you, but believe it or not, like deal number 70, like no, 95 taught me something that I'm like, Oh my God, I never expected that. So you think you're so like cheated from all of your past experiences, your life experiences to say, I'm never going to fail again. Um, and so I bought this house with my brother because I wanted to teach him how to flip homes. And so I ended up buying a house in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is all the way across the country. And I figured I would, you know, manage this project effortlessly out of state. Um, and he was boots on the ground and we, I actually flew down there and, uh, it was a 3,500 square foot massive renovation and met with 15 different contractors 
picked the contractor that was most expensive uh, because he was able to show us, like actually drive us through his other properties. We saw how well he had fixed those up. We were like, perfect, you're the perfect person to teach my brother how to do this. Ended up hiring him and he just stopped showing up to work. Like he took everything down to the studs. He touched things he wasn't supposed to touch. Uh, He put in beans he wasn't supposed to put in. And then when he stops showing up to work, we realized he hadn't pulled the permits. He said he had pulled. He hadn't done any of the engineering. And here we were back to square one. Now the house had significantly depreciated because it was all bones. And we had to reconstruct um, and we just didn't have the budget. So we started off this project with a 300K profit spread. Massive deal. One of the best neighborhoods in Raleigh called Cary. And it's like where all the tech is. It's like, what could go wrong? Um, So we started off with a 300K profit spread and ended up losing 120K. Now, the good thing for me was my two partners on this were my sister and my brother. And so... (laughs) I was like, this is, thank God, because the the amazing thing is like I've raised millions of dollars and I've never lost anyone, any money. I have like a super clean track record because I always pay my debt and I make sure that everyone's made whole, even if I have to make a loss. And so on this project, I was like, okay, I'm going to take all the losses. I'm not taking a loss from my, I'm not, you know, making my brother and sister lose their money ever, but. I'm like, I'm going to pay you guys. I'm going to take all the losses, uh, 120K. But the the thing that actually showed me that, you know, I mean, it was such a gut punch, right? Like, um, but the thing is, my brother got like a master's degree in flipping homes. He now knows how to tackle every situation. He is exactly like me. Like he shows up to work. He has been energy, knows how to deal with contractors, knows how to get work done. And when things are rough and tough, like he shows up. And that was the silver lining in all this. Is like I discovered my brother in a way. And he discovered this amazing world of real estate investing and how hard it can be and how much it can only get better. Um, so I think that was a great learning experience. Yeah, and if you think, right? if you think and I failed, right? I failed. Yeah. Like, although it wasn't my fault, I still failed. Yeah, and if you think about it, I mean, one hundred twenty-five thousand. Yeah, it's a lot of money, but like that's a college education on flipping houses, right? So oh, you can go on to flip, yeah. you know, you know, hundreds, thousands of houses, and yeah, he paid the price, or maybe you did. <laughs> Thanks. I paid the price, yeah. yeah. <laughs> on the first one, but but you know, lesson learned. You know, meet, teach a man to fish, right? Um, and yeah. and I think that's I think that's really great, and I, I think it's important that you know I, I love this and I love this story because you were like, well, it wasn't my first time; it was my ninety-fifth time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's like pilots, we can relate to that, where it doesn't matter how many years you've been flying, like complacency right, right. is what kills us, right? That's what that's what creates an accident. And so we have to be sharp, and we have to stay sharp. And just because we're flying with somebody who's really well experienced and has gone through a lot doesn't mean that something won't come up on that flight that's different, right? Right. And, you know, you did all the right things. 15 contractors, I don't think I've ever vetted 15 yeah. contractors, right? You know, you got eyes on the property. You picked the best one. You didn't necessarily go with the cheapest, right? Sound familiar? This sounds like a best practice. Mm-hmm. And, and it's still messed up, right? So like, you, you yeah, I think the, the takeaway there is like, you've got to have grit and sort of determination to get through this and be willing to walk away with a loss. Yeah. And I think that's reality in, in every project you do, whether it is active or passive uh, in this so case. Um, Okay, so before we dive deeper, if someone's thinking, man, this sounds awful, I'm never going to flip a house, <laughs> can, you, can you share your biggest win so, so uh, we can build some excitement around, around what's possible? Yeah, um, absolutely. So this is in no means uh, the biggest financial win, but this is typically how my projects go. I buy a house to flip. I have an amazing general contracting team. I have an amazing listing team. So I buy a house. I design it. I let them take it away. And then, it, you know, they finish all the construction, electrical, plumbing, insulation, drywall. That's when I come back in. I pick all of the finish work, like the, the tile, the trim, the cabinets, the colors, uh, exterior paint colors, what the landscaping looks like. I put my touch on it and they complete it. And then we sell it and we get 200K over ask. Um, and then I just end up making like 100 to 300K profit from this one small deal that I maybe spent three or four weeks on. 
Um, that's so that's typically, I would say, 60 to 65 percent of my work. So it is doable. Like if you find a system that works and you can repeat that system, yes, it's absolutely doable. Um, sometimes there's issues like with permitting or, you know, crazy contractors or just a dull market, but that's par for the course. I don't what know many people that are one man bands, right? And I'm, I'm going to don't take this the wrong way, but that's, what's impressive about you. Like you don't have an office with like 400 mm -hmm. people working for you or whatever. Like you have mastered the efficiency of being able to reduce the time that you spend on a project and sort of have like an outsourced team that knocks this down. Like if you could give one tip on that, like what is your, what is your one sage advice on, right? Cause I've never really met anybody on your team, but I know you're doing all this really great stuff and, and very successful at it. Like what's, how do you, how do you do that? It's magic. <laughs> you know, this, this industry is perfect for that because you can 1099 everyone. My consultants are 1099, my underwriters 1099. Every, everyone gets paid really well, but they're also really good at what they do. Um, my wholesaler is best in the business. My contractor is best in the business. But do they work for me solely? No. But do they wor like working for me best? Yes. And that's because of, you know, you just have to have an energy. You have to be positive when times are tough. But also you have to take care of your people. I make sure to pay my people really well. Like when they ask to get paid, they get paid. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. And if they're charging me more for something and I know that that's the case, I still let, let it pass because I'm like, look, I, some, people need to feel like they're winning too. And if they don't feel like they're winning, then you're not winning. And then the other thing too is you just do what you say you're going to do. Um, so if I say, hey, send me this deal, I'll underwrite it, tell you in five minutes whether I'm going to buy it or not. And then you send me a deal and I sit on it for 15 days. Right. I'm not your best client. Um, and so just by doing that and by strategically picking the people I want to work with, like I have the same escrow company for 10 years, same stage I used for 10 years, uh, wholesalers, you know, amazing companies that I work with, that I worked with for 10 years. And that's hard to do in an industry where everything is so fluid. Um, like I've done about 40 deals with my current contractors. They're also my private lenders on most deals. Um, and that just takes time to build and these relationships go a long way. And it makes you have to spend less time in your business. Yeah. That's such a great point. You know, when I was buying more physical properties, uh, one of the things that, that I really focused on was having a clear uh, buy box in terms of what I wanted, right? Because there's nothing that'll drive a, a real estate agent or a broker nuts uh, more than someone that says, I want to buy some real estate. Okay, what's your price range? Uh, what what neighborhood do you want it in? I mean, you know, where it, it's like, it's like saying, uh, let's go get ice cream. What flavor do you want? And the, the guy's standing right. there like, what do you want? So getting yeah. clear on, on what exactly is your, your criteria is really important because otherwise you're just going to drive the, uh, uh, your service providers nuts. Nuts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, like uh, you've always instruct me as the type of person that knows how to analyze a deal. You have your underwriter, you have your data, but I feel like you have a, a immense amount of intuition right? Yeah. To these opportunities. <laughs> yeah. Like you, you can kind of see through, I, I think you're, you're, you have a digital business card, which I'll, we'll throw in the show notes. We'll resurrect that, you know, your, your ability to see through walls, right? And, and sort of, I know that we're using an analogy here, but or figure of speech, but you know, you, you've got a good intuition to like, just know when it's a good and, and know when it's bad and, and know where you can step in and add value. Can you kind of like share kind of uh, an, it, an instance where you use that intuition or that gut feeling and it turned out really successfully in a real estate deal? Yes. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, to do a hundred or 200 deals, you have to walk a thousand properties. When you walk a thousand properties, that intuition becomes muscle memory. You know, it's not, it's not even intuition anymore. It's just like you, you walk it like yesterday. I walked this property, wholesaler one at 678K. I, and then he said it was 100K rehab. Well, it was a 250K rehab. And I wouldn't even touch the property over 500K. But they have 50 people walking it today. And some sucker is going to buy it. 
Totally. And go through the yeah. process of failing or succeeding or whatever it is, right? It's their story. But I just, um, I don't even know if it's intuition anymore. Like, I just feel like I have all these other parameters, like, that I just know what works and what doesn't. I know how to look at something from a buyer's perspective or a tenant's perspective. But, um, okay, so one example is I used to hang my license at Keller Williams. And what was great about that was they're all retail agents. I was like literally the only investor broker. And so someone found an off-market fourplex in Auburn and did not know what to do with it. It was one of his clients that brought him this deal and she had moved out of the state to California. She bought this fourplex. It was underperforming. And now she's like, I don't know what to do with it. I don't want it. So he sold it to me and he charged me an assignment fee of 50K. I was happy to pay it because I love the project. Did, did not know where Auburn was. I didn't know if it was north, south, east, west. Looked at it on a map. But I just liked the numbers. Um, and that was a gut feeling. Like this was going to be a good project. Fast forward to after the renovations and refinance, it appraised for twice as much as I'd bought it. So I got paid to actually own this deal. And now we make about three grand in monthly cash flow on that one property. And I'm owning it since 2020. And it has obviously appreciated like crazy. Um, but also, you know, it's like hiring the right property management team, hiring the right contractors to do the work. And then they, you can really turn these profits and these deals. So just, you know, I don't know, like just knowing what to look for really helps. And that only comes from practice. Yeah. How does somebody find a good property manager and a good contractor? Um, a good contractor. So this is such a hack. I have found contractors every way. I've gone to Home Depot and kitchen and bath stores early in the morning at 7 a.m. to see who's coming in, who has a nice contractor jacket on, um, that's branding themselves and that's showing up to work. Um, work great. Then I found contractors and meetup groups, terrible, mm. awful, because people like really pump themselves up and talk themselves up. They have nothing to show for it at the end. Bad, mm. bad contractors. So best way is if you have a subcontractor that you worked with, it could just be someone who came to fix something in your house, electrical plumber. And then you go ask them, like, who are the contractors you work with that pays you on time, that does good work, that actually shows up for the client every single time, that communicates. And then if they can give you a list of names, those are the best bet. And then if you can get them to give you referrals for people in your industry that you know, um, that's just a bonus. And then how do you find good property managers? I have hired the worst property managers and then ended up knowing what to look for in the bad ones and knowing what to look for for good ones. Um, and then you feed them one property at a time. Like I have, I don't know, 10 or something buildings and uh, 30 or 40 units around the city. I've lost count, but I just, I didn't give him all of it at once. I had like three or four different property managers. And then I started feeding my property manager, my own units. And today he's a tenant of mine at my Dexter property. Um, yeah. But also he manages all of my other units. I think that's so inspiring. You know, for anybody listening, you, you hear her saying, I lost count of how many buildings I own and, <laughs> uh, and how many units I own. It's so cool. Well, you know, when someone, when someone hasn't touched real estate before and it's this big, scary wall, uh, it can be completely overwhelming and intimidating, but, but you know, you're, you're out there doing it. And uh, I just love that. I love that. Yeah. And I, and I, wa I also want to capture like, you know, it started probably with some intuition, right? Like where's Auburn? Is it North, South, East, West? You know, where is it? The number, but, but, but you had mastered the numbers, yeah. right? So you, you had analytical skills that set you up for at least knowing that part of it, right? And that came probably through practice. Like you underwrote a handful of properties and you probably took some kind of a class or grabbed somebody's spreadsheet. You weren't just willy-nilly, right? But, but right. as far no. as the intuition was, hey, the numbers work on this deal. I want to move forward with it and buy it. I may not know where Auburn is on a map, but right. I know that the numbers work. So you kind of took that like, that analytical step mixed with some intuition. And now, now of course, you can walk any property and, and I'm the same way, right? Like you just, right. you get onto it, you step foot onto a property and you're like, yep, this is not a deal. Or right. like, hey, we've got something here. So, um, you know, I think it really, that, that approach kind of helps, you know, 
aviators or pilots looking to get into this stuff, uh, you just get get part of it down at least, you know, and take small bites of of the of the of the right. apple, right? And eventually, you'll you'll know what right looks like when you find it. So, I think that's really good. Switching gears a little bit, um, let's talk about like you do flips, you do multifamily, you do rentals. You're in Raleigh, you're in West Seattle. I know you're you're kind of all over the place, and I know that you have a pretty diverse bench of not only investments, but professionals that help you uh, drive success in what you do. Um, can you talk to, you know, how those have opened up new doors to possibilities? I mean, you know, I know it's like, for an example, like, you know, when I was looking for my first self-storage facility, um, it actually landed me in an RV park, right? Because the guy said, hey, I got this RV park for sale. And so it sort of like opened up a new door and then I got into that market. So can you talk about how that's kind of played a role in kind of doing different things, kind of opening yeah. up new ones? Yeah. Um, the first three years that I was in the business, all I did was flip homes because I wanted to just get really good at flipping homes and kind of find a method to the madness. And so that's all I did. And then in year four, I said, oh, you know, I should become a real estate broker. So a lot of people look at me and say, Are you a, you're, you're a broker. And I was like, I forget that I'm a broker sometimes because I only did that as, you know, um, just to add another tool kit, the toolbox to the tool, tool to the tool box. Um, and so when I became a real estate broker, I realized, oh, wow, this is actually really fun. I like to negotiate deals. I like to help buyers and sellers. And then on a whim, just as a hobby, sold about 40 million in real estate. But that's not even like, Marketing, like you never find myself, find me marketing myself as a real estate broker. I should, but I don't because I forget. Um, but then I, so one of the houses that I flipped uh, or that I bought to flip, what happened was I had, I don't know, it was some networking event that I went to and the speaker was like, look, you always have to look at the, look at multiple exits on the deal. And I was like, huh, that's interesting because I never did that before. Um, and I've lost probably millions of dollars not doing that. So I had this property. It was a single family house on a large lot, like almost an acre. And I was like, this is interesting. Um, what can I do with this? So fast forward four years later, I had subdivided the lot and sold. And I had um, flipped the existing home. Uh, was able to get two more lots on this one lot. So I ended up selling that house and then creating these two lots and selling the lots of separately and making a million dollar profit. Hmm. And I would have never done that. Like if I hadn't looked at it from a different angle. So then that got me thinking like, what else can I do? So then I bought another house to flip, ended up holding it, putting an addition, a 1200 square foot addition, bought it for 560 today worth like 2 million and it's still part of my rental portfolio. Um, and so I just started to look at things differently and saying, okay, what else can I do? Where else can I go? Over COVID, because, you know, we were all stuck at home, I was on LinkedIn a lot. And my LinkedIn network wasn't on what flipping homes. Everyone talking about syndications, commercial deals, you know, buying multifamily, apartment buildings, um, office buildings. And so I was like, okay, it would be really fun to go, you know, like do something in that space. So then I had lunch with my friend Ryan Gibson. Oh. who said, oh, you should have, you should do a fund of funds. And I was like, huh, what is that? So then I went and researched it and ended up doing a fund of funds for an operator out of uh, California, uh, Florida. And now I'm part of a $30 million project. Uh, we have 160 units in Maitland, Florida. And uh, I got some amazing investors on it. And uh, that was my funds, fund of funds. And then I said, okay, what if I actually operated and did a whole syndication myself? So that's when I bought that property in West Seattle. It's just a 12 unit. And, uh, even Joe Fearless is one of my investors, my LPs nice. on that. So just really fun things that puts me out in the world. And then I like to share my story and just educate people. And that brings more opportunities. So then, you know, I just, and I never thought about holding a passive income portfolio because I was like, ah, that just sounds like work. It is a lot of work. It's, there's nothing passive about passive income. Um, but that led me to start holding dentals. Um, and so that's why I have all these units is I just make some money on flips and then go buy rental properties or just accidentally like own rentals. And um, so, yes, yeah, so it's just you branch out in so many different ways um, to the point where now I've done 
rooming houses, Airbnbs, event spaces, adult family homes. Um, want to really do like a, a houseboat at some point, but that's kind of cool. So great. Yeah. And it, here's the thing, like, you know, I, I have this saying that like everything works and nothing works. Like you got to get out there in the world and you got to meet people and you got to be open-minded and listen to what other people are doing mm -hmm. because then it leads to so many different other things. And I think that's the point here is like, if you keep yourself diversified with who you talk to, who you meet, where you go, what markets you're in, your investment strategy, how you kind of accumulate capital and, and invest it. It's, it's really neat all the different things you can do. You uh, know, the other thing, the one thing that I'll add to that is you can go in all these different directions, but you have to have a core competency that you can always fall back on if all ends fail. And that for me is flipping distressed properties. I got so good at renovating distressed properties that no matter where I go, what I do in my life, I can always do that. So I still flip homes. People are like, oh, I don't flip homes anymore. I still flip homes. Because why am I leaving a million dollars a year from three wheels when I can still do all this other stuff and just flip homes passively? Like I flip homes passively and it's more passive income than owning a passive rental portfolio. Yeah, just remember if you're listening and you've never flipped a house, it's not a passive activity. <laughs> <laughs> and so you get like, 200 you do or, about 100. Unless you've done 100 of them. That's yeah, right. you do 100. Then it, then it comes a little bit more uh, programmatic or otherwise it's just insanity. Yeah. But um, no, that, one, that's, that, yeah. One thing Take I want to, to note uh, for anybody that's thinking about flipping houses, and I think it's important to, to call attention to, is the tax treatment of flips. Can we mm -hmm. just very briefly touch on that uh, versus holding, uh, you know, flipping a house and then holding it as a long-term rental versus flipping it? Um, oh, and yeah. how that's that's treated tax wise. Yeah. So flipping houses, um, basically you have to pay like short term capital gains, which is painful. Um, and so if you can counter that with owning a passive income portfolio, you can always take depreciation on your rental properties, um, to kind of mask that with your active income, because if you're making active income, like a lot of active income on short term capital gains, then you have to have something to fall back on to kind of reduce right. your gross income. Right. Otherwise, so, you're just going to spend everything on being the IRS. And just, that's just exactly remember, though, just remember, why, Leica is ahead. a real estate professional. Real estate so professional, so exactly. Big, right. big difference, right? Yes. So if you're a pilot thinking, oh, I'm going to flip three houses a year like Leica someday and make a million dollars, and you're not real, yeah. you are, are probably still not a real estate professional. I mean, three, I don't know, check with your CPA. We're not giving tax legal investment advice. It's like some number of hours you have to spend on your real estate portfolio every week. Yeah, 750, 750 hours a year and more uh, hours than you're spending in your W-2, which uh, we've talked about this on other episodes. So you can go back yeah, and listen to, to those. But, um, you know, I just want to call that out because if you're a, a pilot who's making five, $600,000 a year and you're like, hey, I'm going to go flip this house and you flip it in, uh, you know, six months, the IRS considers it inventory. It is not long-term capital gains. It's right. a it's a flip, and so that's going to be uh, quite painful when you get the tax bill for that. So, um, I want to I want to quickly uh, talk about education versus action, uh, because I think that those two things really go hand in hand when you're talking about doing you know following in Leica's footsteps here and going out and and getting your hands dirty. Uh, I think there's an equal need to educate yourself and find those resources to, to learn the ropes and then also take action, be willing to break stuff and, and make, make it happen. So like, can you give some, some insight into where people can find this education? Like what, what resources did, did you trace down and consume prior to flipping your first house? You know, sadly, like when I was, um, this was 10 years ago, there was no bigger pockets. There was right. no um, social media. There was no Facebook, no Instagram. So it was really hard to find any of these educational sources. So I actually joined a company called Fortune Builders. And they actually provided a lot of education for real estate investors, kind of laid out like what different kinds of investments looked like, how many different kinds of investments you could do, what was available to you, taxes, uh, hiring the right contractors, analyzing numbers, putting together a scope of work. So I just got a lot from that. 
They also had a really good system of having coaching calls with a coach every week. And you could pick, you know, different kinds of coaches. Like, is it someone that knows how to raise capital? Someone that knows taxes? Someone that knows how to set up a company? And so I basically did a call with a different coach every week just to kind of understand different aspects of investing because there's a lot. So can they, I, they, yeah. Sorry, can I ask you how much you paid for that? Uh, back then, it was 25 grand. I think today it's about 50 or 75 I don't important, know, but important for people to, to, to see that, that, that she made yeah. an investment in herself. You know, a lot of times when people say, Hey, I, I have my first $25,000. Should I put it into a syndication deal? I say, no, you should spend it on education. So, and 100%. people are so hesitant to spend 25,000 or $50,000 on some sort of mastermind or, or course, not, not a seminar. Don't go to see some guru, but a coaching program, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, the other thing too is, you know, that was a lot of money for me back then. I mean, it still is a lot of money. And when you spend that kind of money, you have to take action. And so I had a W2 and it, I was spending that. And that was like, I don't know, it was a third of my W2 that I was getting paid right. for a whole year. Then so I was like, okay, if I'm spending all of this money I ha and don't take action, that's like a huge waste. Like I have to burn the book. And that helped me do that. Um, so, I really want to hang on that for a second because like, I think a lot of people spend the money to go find the motivation and then the motivation wanes and they're like, you got to be motivated. Like, yeah. you, you, you know, it's like money, motivation, time commitment, let's go. Right. Where I think a lot Absolutely. of people in these coaching classes are like lacking motivation and it's like they spend all this money and they take all this education and it's not education for effective action. It's just education to like get inspired and like that's not the point of the education. So, and so that's the second part of my question is, okay, so education plus action, right? So at what point, because you can, you can consume bigger pot, the bigger pockets podcast, which is fantastic. If you've never listened to it, you want to get into real estate actively, you can get a PhD in real estate just by listening to the thousand episodes of bigger pockets that are out there. I mean, fantastic. but also look at your podcast, right? It is so yeah. educational and you, you know, it's not just for pilots. Is anyone listening to you? It is mindset, it's inspiration, it's education, it's hardcore facts and actionable items. Like just finding like true operators that are willing to take the time to record podcasts and put it out there in the universe. Like how much do you even charge for this? Zero. Nothing. Right? Bad. It's just, it's just public. Like if I had this, I wouldn't maybe necessarily invest the 25K because today right. like there's so much free education, but you have to also know like who is putting that education out and and then like pick, pick accurately. And so at what point, because you can consume educational content for years, but if you don't do anything with it, like you said, nothing is ever going to happen. Right. So at what point, you know, what, what advice would you have to, to people? It's like, okay, how much education, educational content do you need to consume? Yeah. And then when do you need to kind of jump out of the nest? I think your education has to go hand in hand with taking action. So if I just sat there and I did all these courses, spoke to all these coaches and didn't take any action, then all that education is of no use. So I ended up um, within three months of quitting my job, I was under contract with my first fix and flip. And it really helped that I had this coaching platform and all these coaches along with my first project because then I could tie them hand in hand and be like, okay, practically this is what I'm doing. Whereas theoretically, this is all the education that goes with it. So I almost feel like action has to be the first step. And then once you jump off that tip, you can open your parachute. You know what Go I love? Or and Tate and say, come pick me up. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. action is the first step. You know what I love about that? That's how we learned how to fly. Like, yeah. you walk into a flight school on day one, it's like, all right, let's go get in the plane. I yeah. mean, I think that's, I don't think I would have lasted as a pilot if it wasn't that way, because that's what makes it fun. Like a, what didn't it, wait, it reminds me, Ryan, I have to say this. So Ryan <laughs> made me fly his Cessna. He gave me the steering wheel and he said, okay, it's all yours, fly. And I was like, wait, True. what? <laughs> we are, we're going to crash. But I was able to fly that Cessna, of course, with his, his training, he's sitting right next to me. But I, that was something I never thought I could do. And until, like, I, you know, if Ryan hadn't put his faith in me, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Yeah. And Thank you know, you, cool that, yeah, by the way, that was a whole, that was a charity uh, flight that we gave away and Leica was the, the winning bid 
and we flew to a development that we did. We built 217 manufacturing home community in 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 north in the northwest. We flew up there and uh, actually met up with another pilot that that lives at the airport and has a um, an RV that he built in his garage. Amazing plane. And we did some formation flying over the project, and so that was like the coolest day ever. But like, nice what, r- real quick on these classes, like, what didn't that class teach you? Like, what what <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe we have to do a whole episode on that, but what did <laughs> teach you? <laughs> so while the classes are really good, like podcasts, books, everything's really good at laying out to you the different, you know, aspects of an investment property or making an investment or talking about networking and talking about putting yourself out there in events, right? But mm-hmm. until you're actually there, until you're at that event and speaking to that person, like you don't know what the outcome is going to be. And then each outcome is so different than what someone else's experience was. So it's about how you then take action on those outcomes. Um, and I always say real estate has no roadmap, right? Ryan, like you didn't say 10 years ago, this is where I'm going to be. or I'm going to build this amazing facility in Black Diamond. Like that was just something that you were able to discover. And then you take, took action to do that. So my journey and your journey is so different. Um, so I'm like, you have to create your own roadmap and no book, no education platform can teach you that. Yeah, yeah I think that's so important. Being willing to, you know, uh, I call it being willing to break stuff. You know, yeah. in my, early in my career, it's like I, I read so many books and listened to podcasts. And it's like at the end of the day, you got to go out there and fail. If you're going to do it actively, you got to go be willing to go out there and hire the wrong contractor and hire the wrong property manager and fix it and fix it because that's the only way you're going to learn. It's like so, solo flight, uh, you know, our first solo exactly. cross countries, we took off. You're the only person in the airplane. You missed it. A- ATC calls. You, you might've landed on the wrong runway somewhere. It's like, Hey, but that's how you, how you learn. Right. Uh, hopefully it was an untowered airport. Um, <laughs> But uh, well, my, what my flight instructor did for solos is uh, if you're if you're in Michigan, you'll be you know, you're very familiar with the th- with the thumb on the hand. So what he did was he found an airport at the tip of the thumb. So you couldn't screw it up like you couldn't you couldn't miss the airport because it was you just flew towards the end of the thumb and then, you know, you, you hit the airport. So I like that. I was in uh, I was in yeah. L.A. Uh, dodging Class B airspace. But oh, wow, that's a little different, a little different. Like th- this has been really great having you on the show. Um What's, what's one thing in the last six months that you've learned, you know, in all your wisdom and hundreds of flips, what's one new thing that you've learned in the six months, in the previous six months that maybe you haven't shared with anybody? I mean, this is what Tate said. Um, things are going to fail and you have to be willing to fix things. And in the last six months, you know, I have taken on projects I've never done before. I built a dad who I've, um, I'm doing a renovation that is going to cost me a half a million bucks on a house, a single family house. Things I've not done before, but I just feel like every opportunity comes with new learnings and new parts. And, um, and there's so many things that can fail. You know, the market can be horrendous. Interest rates high. It's just how do you keep slugging along and in the last six months, I felt it more than I felt it in my entire career before. But also in the last six months, I can tell you that I've got this because the last time this happened to me, maybe four or five years ago, I had no net worth to back up my losses. Today, I'm like a $2 million loss, bring it on. Like I can handle that. So to be able to get there, it took a lot of hard work and it's still not done. But at least now I can say that I have really good financial stability to stand on. Like if I'm raising capital and someone's like, oh, you know, can I see your portfolio, whatever, here you go, you know? Um, And so it's just baiting yourself up to be there, to be sure um, that nothing in the market can, can hurt you. If we have to go through a full financial crisis, cannot hurt you. I think just setting yourself up for that is important. Well, speaking of net worth, uh, last question, I swear. Uh, so you are obviously financially free many times over from, from all the hard work of the last decade. What makes you keep doing it? Like why are you still flipping houses and, and raising money and doing all this stuff? 
because my bank account is always empty. <laughs> I'm like, because your I net really, worth is in bricks and sticks, right? It's bricks and sticks, right? Like you can't eat your net worth. And so I'm like, okay, I just got to keep doing more and more and more and more. But I just had lunch with my friend Jimmy Klein, who Ryan knows. Yeah. And Jimmy's like, if I stopped doing what I did today, I could retire super rich. Yeah. But there's also this like hunger and this craving to keep doing deals and to keep positioning assets and to keep negotiating and, you know, finding amazing opportunities. The other thing is that you put yourself in this position and man, those golden opportunities keep hitting your doorstep. And so then you're like, do I not do that? Like, I know what to do. So should I not take that? Should I not do that? Just because I feel like I'm okay. So it's just this like hunger. And at some point I hope it dies. And I just hope I get lazy and I just Why? want to sit in my home no. and do nothing. And yes, <laughs> it would... I just hope, I hope I, that just... bug bites me. Let's just let's just summarize this uh, in, in one word. We're, we're American, right? right. We're freaking out right. there. This is what we do. This is the way of America. Like we uh, push right. and, and strive and and grow, and that and that's why real estate is tax advantage because we, you know, the United States wants people to invest in real estate, right? Right, and we're always pushing the envelope because we're entrepreneurs, and like that's that's what it's all about. I mean, absolutely. Well, I, I get it. Real estate is fun. I mean, I'm yeah. I got one more question. You run a, an amazing meetup with like the best guests and you pack the room. How the heck do you do that? I mean, <laughs> otherwise, you know, it, um, it, it's just impressive. I mean, every time I go to your meetup, it, it, is a, it is a standing room only audience. And I got to be honest, I've tried to have my own meetup and it's been like, meh, whatever, right? What, what, what is your secret? I think just finding good speakers and having valuable content to just give away. Um, it's also not about packing the room, but who you're packing the room with. Like having you come to the meetup and, you know, rubbing shoulders with just people that are just getting started. Like, can you imagine the value that oh. you're adding to the attendees? And so, like, I just feel like the people that attend the meetup too, not just the speakers, They've just been, they've accomplished a lot. And because they've accomplished a lot, they can add a lot of value to someone that's just newer. Plus, I'm really plugged into the tech communities. And so we have a lot of people from Amazon and Meta and Google attending because they have the capital. They want to invest in real estate. They just don't know how. And yeah. that's a really good place for them to come and meet people like you that they can invest in. Um, so I think just providing value and creating this platform and plus, I've done this for six, seven years now. This meetup's yeah. been running. Yeah, and um, you've never Seattle, missed a month. Yeah, if you're in Seattle, Real Estate at Work is the name of our meetup. So I'm sure it's on meetup.com and maybe Eventbrite. It is. It's on meetup.com and, um, and it's on Facebook. And we're going to have um, Ryan and maybe take some speak this year. So I'd love it. Yeah, yeah we have done this live in front of your, uh, your meetup. Anyway, like yes. a lot of listeners get in touch with you. Uh, I know you've got a, huge Instagram following. So maybe you give your handle on Instagram so people can follow all the fun things you do and get inspired. Uh, but how yeah. do you touch? Yeah. Um, just follow me on Instagram or LinkedIn. It's uh, my first and last name, Leka Devta. Um, and now you will respond faster on Instagram than on text. So yeah, that's, that's true. the best way to find me. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thanks for coming on to the show. Um, and for those listeners that have tuned in, if you have any questions, you want to share your experience, your thoughts on real estate investing, l let us know how your journey is going in all this. Um, you can reach out to us at ask at PassiveIncomePilots.com. If you have a question, you want to record yourself on the show like we did in previous episodes, you can go to PassiveIncomePilots.com forward slash question. And uh, you can always check us out on Facebook. So thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll catch you on the next episode.